present to you from the Bay Area UFO Expo Convention Hall number three, this is Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell. I want to thank all of you for being here and joining me today. I've had many kind things said about me that are very generous, but I don't really consider myself to be doing what many people perceive me doing. I'm, I'm very much afraid, and I don't mind saying that I'm afraid even living in my own country today, because I know that the people who are destroying this great republic know who I am by now. And I've had enough threats over the phone and other ways to let me know that I'm not only just being watched, but I'm being watched with an eye to um, one never knows what these people might do. But I figure I've come this far, and I, I say truthfully, it's just my feeling, but my God who brought me here has allowed me to be here. And until such time as I have accomplished what I've started to do, I'm trusting that the Spirit, the Great Spirit, will continue to do what it has always done in my case, and that is to protect me. Uh, because I, I truly believe that nothing happens by chance. I don't believe that I started doing what I do by mere chance. It was back in 1959, I came to California, and I was very... Uh, I had already, in my younger life, my teen years, and even as, a, even as a young kid, I was always interested in theology and UFOs. I was born and raised about a mile from Gulf Breeze, Florida, and so, uh, and Gulf Breeze is world famous for UFOs and extraterrestrial kind of activity. And anyone who's in the UFO field knows that Gulf Breeze is very famous for that. I was born about a mile away from Gulf Breeze, and so I grew up, even at six, seven, and eight years old, having other world experiences. I've had entities coming in my bedroom when I was seven and eight years old. I've had extraordinary experiences in my life, which has um, amazed me. Uh, I realized that, that that nothing was happening by chance. I would meet people, I would have experiences, UFO experiences, but uh, it, has very, it has been very difficult for me. I, uh, I've had a lot of problems with my home life. I lost my wife because of my work. I have lost so much because of what I do. I've been threatened. I've had all kinds of tragedies to have to deal with and live through. But for some reason or another, at all, at this point in my life, appears to have been uh, part of what I do. It's, you know, you, you have the name, you have the game. And so I just go with the flow, and whatever's supposed to happen, I, I just let it happen. I don't try and do anything any longer, because I have found out that, or at least this is my belief, based on all of my years of dedication to doing what I do, and that is researching the world of the occult, I am totally convinced for myself that nothing happens in your life that wasn't supposed to. I don't care if it's a tragedy, I don't care if it's meeting someone, and I go so far as to say no matter how small and insignificant uh, a situation might be, there was a reason. I believe that there is a higher power in the universe that directs the affairs of men. And I am totally convinced that um, this is something that has taken me for many years. I first was interested back in 1959 when I first came to California. I was very... Uh, how many of you have heard me tell the story about the young lady I met? Okay, most of you have, so I won't go into that. Oh, okay. 1959, 
I arrived in Los Angeles with about $9 in my pocket on a Friday night. I have no idea in the world where I was. A uh, 19-year-old kid on the farm, so to speak, and I ended up in Los Angeles. And um, after about a week, I finally found a job. And this was in North Hollywood. I ended up in North Hollywood. We're talking about 48 years ago. And I went to a restaurant in North Hollywood on a Saturday morning in North Hollywood. And there was no seats in the house except one at the uh, counter. And so I sat at the counter and there was a young lady sitting next to me, a young girl sitting next to me about, I was 19, I figured she was about 17 years old. Her name was Sharon. And I, uh, so we started talking and find out, come to find out that I only lived a couple of blocks from her and we both only lived about three or four blocks in town. So when we walked home, uh, she lived about two blocks further from town than I did. And I lived about three blocks from town. So we started meeting on Saturdays and Sundays downtown. And then when we walked home, she knew where I lived, but I never followed her home, so I didn't know exactly where she lived. But I knew it was a couple blocks away. And uh, this went on for three or four months. And one night she came over to my, my apartment and said, my dad wants to talk to you. And I thought to myself, and I told her, I'm not interested to talk to your father about anything. I've got nothing to say to him. Uh, and so she said, no, my dad, my father is a very important man, and he wants to talk to you about something. He has something to tell you. So it sounded interesting. So I went with her. And when I was walking up to the house with her, he happened by chance to be coming out of the house. And the moment I saw him, I had a strange, overwhelming feeling of a spiritual feeling come over me that I can't explain, but it was a euphoric feeling, uh, uh, some kind of a spiritual reaction to this man's presence. And I noticed immediately, the thing I noticed about him just instantly was that he was totally in control of himself. There was nothing that he did that wasn't pre-planned. I mean, you could tell the way he moved, the way he acted, his mannerisms. I knew there's something about this guy that's off the wall. I've never seen anyone operate like this before. So he said, he motioned for us, he said, come on in. And I'm watching him, and I went in and sat down while my girlfriend Sharon had a younger sister named Mary. So the two girls sat on the floor by the fireplace, and there was a sofa, and he sat on one end of the sofa, and I sat on the other. His wife, I didn't meet that night, was in the kitchen. And so we were just, he was just talking, asking me how I like living in California, and how do you like your job, and are you working, how do you like your job, and weather, and whatever. Just making small talk, and I became more at ease around him. Though so my spirit and my gut told me that this man is not a normal man. I don't know what I'm in the presence of here, but whatever it is, I know there's something going on here. But my inhibitions were dropping, and because he was a very pleasant, very nice guy. And so we talked for a few minutes about all kinds of things. And then he said to me, very nonchalant, he said, Remember back in Florida, when you were eight years old, how your father built a new back porch? Your uncle helped him. They tore down the old back porch and built a new back porch. And he said, remember how your dad used green lumber and it smelled funny because it was green lumber? And one night when you were in bed, you got out of bed, remember? And it was a very bright moon. And you went out on the back porch <coughs> and you, <coughs> excuse me, and you looked at the moon and you talk to God, and remember when you talk to God, what you said, and I was frightened, and tears were coming to my eyes, and I didn't want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but I was scared. And he looked at me very nonchalant, and he says, did that happen or didn't it? And I said, yes, that happened. And he said, what did you say to God? And I, I didn't say anything for a moment, because I was searching for, who is this man, and why is he doing this? And he said, what did you say? You said to God that you wanted to do something important with your life. Isn't that what you said? And I said, yes, that's what I said. And he said, well, how did I know that? How would I have known that? 
I said, I don't know how you know that. And he said, I know that because we were there. We heard you. You just didn't see us, did you? And I, I really was very emotional and fighting back the tears because he was frightening me. And he says, uh, we've been watching you for a long time. And after all, you did ask to do something, didn't you? And I said, yes. He said, well, that's why we brought you to California, because we're going to train you and prepare you to do something for us. But it will not come to much later in your life, but you have to start somewhere. So we have brought you here. And I said, what do you mean brought me here? He said, well, why are you here? And I said, I don't know why I'm here. I just, I just ended up in California, Los Angeles. He said, no, we brought you here. We have something for you to do, but it will not be for many years to come, later on in your life, but we are going to start you on a journey. And one day, when the time comes, you will know what it is that you have to do. <clears throat> and he gave me a book. He said, I want you to go home and read this book, and we will talk later. And, uh, and I'm still mesmerized listening to this guy. And he gave me the book. He gave me a book to read, which is The Complete Works of Charles Fort. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book, but you can still buy it today. And it's an extraordinary book. Uh, then he said to me, he said, <clears throat> where you live, as a child, you were always interested in UFOs and aliens, weren't you? And I said, yes, I always did. He said, <clears throat> have you ever seen a UFO up close? And I said, no. He said, yes, we know that. I know that. But would you like to see one tonight? And I said, yes, I would. He said, well, come with me. This is in North Hollywood, Los, Los Angeles, 1959. And we went out into the front yard. The two girls went with us, went with me and him. And he looked up in that sky and started inaudibly talking to someone. But not, you couldn't hear him, but his mouth is moving. He's talking to someone. And then he turns to me and says, they said they'll be here in a few minutes. They'll be coming from the mountain, from uh, Griffith Park, and they're going north. And they'll be here in a couple of minutes, he said. And I said, who are you talking about? And he said, you'll see. And a few moments later, three UFOs, for lack of a better term, unidentified uh, flying objects, <clears throat> they were beautiful, round, disc-shaped things which looked like a pie cut in six or eight slices, and each slice was a different color. And they were circulating to colors, but not so fast as to blend the colors, but just circulating. But the thing I noticed about them was the colors were so incredibly brilliant, like laser colors, very brilliant color. And they're circulating, three of them, in a triangle formation, came over and hovered right above us, very close, and I making no sound at all. And I was, of course, at 19 years old, I was totally blown away. And I'm standing there staring at these beautiful three disc-shaped objects and I look at him, and he's looking at me. And I look at the girls, and they're looking at me. And my girlfriend has got the look on her face like, well, I told you, this is him. And I was amazed. I was looking at the girls. I looked at him. I was looking at And I was just, I, I had no words to, to describe the beauty of what I was seeing. And then he talked with them again, couldn't hear him. And then they left and went out north and went over, and they're gone. And I said, what in the world was that? He said, that's us. We're here. And we have something for you to do. So tonight I'm going to begin your journey for you. And this is what I want you to do. Take this book, go home, and later on we will talk more. And I did. Took the book home, went all through it. But my mind was spinning that night because even at 19 years old, I had the presence of mind to know as inexperienced as I was, I had the presence of mind to know that I have been in the company of an extraordinary man tonight. And something is transpiring and happening to me. I felt it. And that was just the beginning of, a, of at least 36 major peak experiences in my life that I have had. Extraordinary stuff. Which brings me to the point I want to talk about a little bit tonight, and that is why the world is the way it is. 
I did a, I did a video called the, the Sons of God. That's a, a, that, a, in my opinion, is an extremely important subject. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin, I was in business with for some time. I helped send him to different companies and countries. What I had wanted to do, I was working at a company called Truth Seeker in San Diego, and I was running, pretty much running the company for about two and a half years. So I had access to funds and the uh, attorneys. I had their attention, and so I was pretty much on my own to spend whatever money I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do with the company. So I talked with Zachariah Sitchin. I told him I wanted to do a 13-week, a 13-one-hour series with him, and he was agreeable. We sent him to like five different countries. Unfortunately, that situation did not work out. The lady who was the, uh, the I guess you would call the manager of the foundation, decided about three quarters of the way through that she didn't want to finance it anymore. And so she just said, I don't want to do that anymore. And I said, what do you mean you don't want to do that anymore? You've got a contract with this man. We've already spent hundreds of dollars on, on this man. And she said, I don't care. I don't want to do it anymore. That's it. It's over. Well, Zachariah Sitchin didn't lose out anything. I mean, he, he did well. I said, you know, he went to four or five countries and had everything videotaped and so he didn't lose anything. I did. And the company ultimately did. But I, I helped bring over a lot of people and get a lot of people started during those years. This is like 1992 to 95. I brought David Ike to America. I got him started with uh, his lectures in America, printing his books and publishing his books, I mean, and sending him around the world to speak. Uh, uh, let's see, Richard Hoagland. John Rappaport, gave John Rappaport a job and got him started doing what he's doing now. And so I've had the opportunity to be in the company of and help a lot of people get started in this field. But I feel that it's because I was supposed to do this. I go with the flow right now because, uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm rather fearful about being who I am now and doing what I do. But I just have to believe that the spirit is protecting me because I get threats from the federal government. Uh, I've had telephone threats. Sometimes I'll be talking on the phone and they will break in on my conversations and I will hear them walking around. You can hear them walking around talking about me and then they'll hang up. Well, that's enough of a threat right there. If you're talking with someone and all of a sudden uh, a third party picks up a line and is walking around talking about you and then hangs up, it's not by chance. They just want you to know they're there and they're listening to you. I had an FBI agent quite a few years ago uh, when I had an office in Glendale. I had an FBI agent contact me and he said, Jordan, I just wanted to tell you that he said, this is not a, well, first of all, when he called, he said he was an FBI agent in San Diego, and he gave me his name, so I said, I'll call you back, and I hung up. So I called the operator and called information to get the telephone number of the FBI in San Diego. I called them, asked for him, and they put me through to him. So now I know for sure he is FBI, because I get all kinds of phone calls from people tell me all kinds of things. I don't know who they are. But uh, so I established he was who he said he was. And he said, I just want to let you know that your government does not consider you to be a threat. Now, this was quite a few years ago. And he said, but we are watching everywhere you go, what you do, and who you're talking to. And as long as people are hearing you, the, your government does not consider you to be a threat. If people are hearing you, they don't, the government does not care if people are hearing you is when people begin to listen to you. Now you're going to be considered a threat. If people are just entertained by hearing you, is one thing. But if they're starting to seriously listen to you and we're beginning to see something happening around you where people are starting to listen, we're gonna to have to look at you again. But at this moment, you are not considered to be a threat. And he said, I just want you to know that the working class people at the FBI appreciate and admire what you do. But just be aware that the government is watching everything you do. Well, now I know that, of course, when I was on George Norrie uh, back in 2005 in April, 
toward the end of the program, the, the telephone company, if you heard that program, I got cut off. And when I got cut off, right in the middle of a, of a, of a sentence, I'm talking to George, and the, the phone went dead. And when it went dead, it came back on a few seconds later, and I could hear people walking around in an office, a very small one, because it was re reverberating very close. You could hear them walking around, talking to each other. And somebody, one of the guys said something to the effect, somebody's going to have to deal with this guy, or somebody's going to have to do something about this guy, something like that. And then they started talking a little bit, and I couldn't mumbling. I couldn't get it. I'm, and then all of a sudden, somebody walked over, and I heard him walking over and hanging up the phone. Well, I, I don't think that happens by chance. They wanted me to hear that. And they wanted me to know that they could shut me off, you know, right in the middle of a radio show. So I am, as I said in the beginning, I am afraid right now for my safety in this country because there are a lot of people talking about conspiracies and UFO, and like Bob Dean said today, the UFO situation is far more serious than what we think it is. And I told you, as I said before, <clears throat> about this um, Sons of God subject matter. In the Bible, there's a very different, different words for angel. There are different kinds of entities in the, in the Old Testament. One is called angels. One are called watchers. One is called rebium. Another group of, of entities in the Bible in the Old Testament are you know, the sons of God. And in the, and the, and, and the book of, um, of Genesis 18, we're introduced for the first time to something called the sons of God, who look like men. And they began taking women and having offspring. Um, so I, I've been fascinated with that subject because I think that they're still here, just as Bob Dean said today. I think that these sons of God, whoever they are, that look like us, no, we look like them. And if we are their creation, because remember, God said in the beginning in Genesis 1, uh, 8 and 128 about Adam and Eve, Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Rabbi Marvin Antelman, who was a head of a, a very important rabbinical association back in the mid-60s, I used to talk with him all the time. Rabbi Antelman said, you know, so many people misread that. Both Jews and Gentiles misread the, the, what the scriptures are saying. He said to me, nowhere in the Bible does it say God created man. It doesn't say that. It says God, the gods, <clears throat> first of all, in, the, in Genesis 1.1 1, 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's not what it says in Hebrew. <clears throat> That's not what it says in the original. That's a mistranslation in the King James Bible. What it actually says in the original is in the beginning of the creation, the El Elohim created the heavens and the earth. El Elohim is not God, it's gods in the plural. So it should be correctly read, in the beginning of the creation, the gods created the heavens and the earth, not God. The word God is simply the word dog spelled backwards. So once you understand that El Elohim means the gods more than one, then it makes sense that in Genesis 1.28, the gods said, the gods, plural, said, Come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Because he's already here, so come let us remake this creature. Come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So we are made in the image and the likeness of the Elohim, or the gods. So we say, well, there have been so many instances in the Bible where angels appear to people and they look like a man or look like a woman or look like a man and a man walked up and did this and a man did that. We found that that oh, they do that uh, they weren't men. In Genesis 18, for instance, in Genesis 18 is a story about Abraham and his wife Sarah, and there was <clears throat> and it says that three men. Three men come walking up into the camp, and Abraham went out and greeted them and asked them, well, what is my Lord saying to his servant? He bowed down and did a worship to them. And they said they were on their way to take care of some business, and he said, well, stay here and have something to eat. And the three of them said, no, we cannot stay. We're on our way to other business. And it says in the Bible, in Genesis 18, 
that Abraham insisted that the three men at least stay to have something to eat and then they could go. And so the wife fixed him dinner. Two of the men, the Bible says, got up and left and went to Sodom and Gomorrah. The third one stayed, and it said the third one was the God, the Creator, in all capital letters, the Creator God. And so, of course, we in Genesis 19, the two angels, uh, the two men, go into Sodom and Gomorrah. It said the homosexuals thought they were good-looking men, handsome men, but they weren't exactly men. They were the sons of God, the Elohim, the Anunnaki, if you please. Entities that look like men, but they are supra men and have come here from another place. We call it God. We call them sons of God or angels. No, no. Something else is going on here, and they're among us right now. And so when I see that in the Bible, and there's many, many other places in the Scriptures, both uh, Old and New Testament, that testify to the fact that there are entities that look like humans and they're here. I am totally convinced that I've come across some of them and I've been in the company of some of these entities. Um, I got interested in the conspiratorial apparatus quite by chance. I was, I was always fascinated with Nazism. I've always been fascinated with the Nazi party and who Adolf Hitler and his Nazi cohorts really were, because I realized a long time ago that Adolf Hitler was not who you think he was, and he was not doing what you think he was doing, that there's a lot more to, there's a lot more to the subject of Hitler that has not been um, told to us. It's a bigger story, so I've been very interested in what was going on with Adolf Hitler, really. Because we know that Americans and all the American banks and all the European banks were financing him. And I got his financing from America. That's where he got his money from. So there was something going on between America, the Europeans, and England, and uh, Germany that were financing the Nazis. And then when I began to see the, the religious or spiritual connection with the ancient Jewish religion, and the Nazi religion, and there is an extraordinary connection between ancient Judaism of the, of the Old Testament and the symbols, words, and terms of the Nazi party. And there's a very, and another component of this between ancient Judaism, the Nazi party, also the Vatican comes into the picture. High, if you know, in all religions, there are different levels of understanding. I mean, the, the, the common people understand the religion one way. The priests understand it a little different, a little more. than the higher-up priests understand it a little different. And, of course, it keeps going until you get to the very top. And they've got a whole different uh, thing that they're on. You know, you know, the Pope is into a whole different world than what the common Catholic is. Well, the same thing is true in Nazism. That when you start going up the ladder in the Nazi philosophy, when you get to the very top of what we call Nazi philosophy... We, that is referred to as High Catholicism. High Catholicism is what we today call Nazism. The Vatican is the basis for Nazism and for the whole entire Germanic racial thing on the earth. Comes, and logic alone would tell you that Europe has been dominated for at least 2,300 years by Rome. Under the Caesars of Rome, and then when the fall of the Roman Empire, the Vatican rises to still keep control over the European establishment of, of the hierarchy of, uh, of um, princes and kings and rulers. And so for 1,600 years, the Vatican has dominated Europe. And so we're talking about 2,300 years Rome has dominated Europe under the Caesars, under the Vatican. And for 2,300 years, Europe has dominated the earth. And so ultimately, you begin to take this stuff back to its beginnings and you will find that the Vatican and the whole entire ancient Roman system is the whole answer to what's going on on the planet today. The wars of America are Roman-inspired. 
Vatican, Catholic inspired, the stuff that's going on in the Middle East today, the Holy Father in Rome is behind. And as far as I'm concerned, my mother and my family were all Catholics on both sides of my family. And so I am not condemning the Catholic people. I was one of them. But what I'm telling you is that the Vatican, after 48 years of looking at this subject of secret societies, Illuminati, I'm telling you that the powers that be behind the world scene are religious, not political. I don't want to talk too much about the, the system because I'm afraid to. There are things that I, I would love to be able to tell you, but I'm afraid for my life talking about certain things which I know people here. I don't know who they might be, but there's got to be somebody here listening to me in this audience who are, who are connected to government. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Or eventually somebody's going to hear this on a tape. So either way, powers of government are going to ultimately hear me. And they already know who I am and watching me anyway. But when you understand how the Vatican views the world of mankind and how the Vatican views England and the British and how the British are the servants of the Vatican and there's a connection, a religious political connection between the royalty of England and the Vatican's hierarchy. And, and if you go on my website, you'll see a lot of the symbolism I'm, that make the connection between the Vatican and Britain, Britain today. And then with the coming of America, uh, it's just an extraordinary story about how the world really works. I would guarantee you this. Nothing in this world operates the way you think it does. Nothing. Nothing that you see happening today operates the way you think it does. Banks. I mean, when you give you an example. There are only two things on the earth. This is what the ancient Romans said. And this is still today understood. There are only two things on the earth. Earth land and water. So there are two basic kinds of law on the earth. The law of the land and the law of water. The law of water is the law of the high seas. The law of water is the law of, of money because the law of the land is the law of the people who live on a particular piece of land. But the law of the land is different in every country because the culture is different in every country. So you can do things in Russia you can't do in South Africa. You, know, you could do things in China you can't do in America because it's the law of the land. The land is where the people live. But there was another higher law that Rome has instituted for the past 2300 years. It's called the law of the sea, maritime admiralty. The law of water, the law of the ocean. So the law of water is in fact the law of money. Money is considered to be water. It is the liquid asset the cash flow. And consequently, when you begin to understand how banks work and where do you find a bank? Banks are on both sides of a river, called river banks. Where do you find, what does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the currency because your, your money is currency. It's a current, it's a cash flow, it's the liquid assets. And consequently, when you are broke, you're in hot water, you know? And if you get in trouble with the cops, they're going to have to bail you out, okay? Because your body is over 90% water, or close to 90% water. So let me give you an example about how maritime works, or how the law of water works. When a ship pulls into a harbor, all ships around the world are considered female. That's why you have the captains will always talk about she's a good ship, or she's seaworthy, she's this, she's that. All ships, if it's a rocket ship, sailing ship, airship, it doesn't matter. If it's a ship, it's female because she carries the product. And it's a commercial term. So when a ship pulls into a harbor, it parks at the dock, it's tied off at the dock, and consequently every single item coming in on that ship came in on water. And therefore it is under maritime control. It's under banking control. Money is changing hands. Every time a ship pulls in a harbor, money is changing hands. So each piece, say for instance you've got $800 million worth of toy orders or TV sets, whatever. Each and every individual piece has to have a certificate of manifest. 
because yesterday the ship wasn't here, but today it manifested. So it manifested $800 million worth of Toyotas. So consequently, every ship, uh, every piece that's coming off that ship must have its own manifest. It's called a certificate of manifest. Why? Because she brought the product in. She's sitting in her birth, and that's why when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. And so you have to have a birth certificate. It's signed by the doc. The doc signs your birth certificate. Because you are, yeah, because you are a maritime admiralty product. You came out of your mother's water. And so your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. And your body is worth money. And if you were able, if you were able to get your birth certificate, not a certified copy, but get the original birth certificate back, you will see on the back of the birth certificate stamped all over the world, banks from China to Asia to all Africa, all over the world, stamps on the back of your birth certificate from different banks around the world. Because your birth certificate is a certificate of manifest, because your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. Therefore, you are a security for what we call the body social. The body social is America, the social body we call America. And your body is a, is a security because you continue to work and make money and pay taxes, so you're a security for the system. So when you, when you retire, you get social security. No, no, you are the security for the body social. You're only getting a dividend back for what you have put into the system. I don't have any problem with the social security. I don't have any problem with taxes. I don't have any problem with any of that. It's just a monetary system. So I, I, if you understand how the system works, it has given, I mean, it has many, many flaws, of course, any human system does, but it has given to the greater a number of people in America a very high living. We live better here in this country than kings have in Europe for hundreds of years. So I'm not condemning the system. I just think it's important that the people understand how the system works. Uh, because I use this as an example. If you have a two-story building and you want to put a lot of weight on the second floor, like printing presses or whatever, the smart thing to do is get on a ladder and go up under the, remove the ceiling tiles and look at the foundation of the second floor before you go building on it. So what you're doing is you're standing under the foundation to get understanding. So that's where the word comes from, to understand means to stand under the foundation you're going to build on. Get an education. Understand how things work. Once you begin to see how banking works, then you, you, it becomes apparent that that's why we have courts. Why do you have a court? You play basketball and tennis on a court. Uh, how do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. And, you don't, and these words are all meant to, you know, these words are, are, are purposely used. You know, and the judge rules from the bench. Look up in a Latin dictionary, you'll find the word bench means a bank. Banks were called benches in, in the Latin world. So today, the, rule, the judge rules from the bench or the bank. And uh, that's why he wears a black robe. Uh, black robes were always the, the, the symbol for the god Saturn. Saturn was the god of banking and law and government. That's why judges wear a black robe. Black was the color associated with the planet Saturn. And to wear a black robe in, implies that you are a Saturnian priest. You represent government. You represent the money, the bank. <clears throat> and of course, the bank and, and, and the court, it's a game. You, because like I said, basketball and tennis on a court. The same thing in a court, in a lawful court. You've got this team of lawyers and that team of lawyers, and you, the whole idea is put the ball back in the other guy's court. Then they pick it up and throw it back at you, and the judge is a referee wearing the black robe, the same black robe Catholic priests wear. Because all of this goes back to Rome. All of our whole judicial system and banking system goes back to the Vatican, and it can be traced back. The words, terms, and symbols can be traced all the way back to ancient Rome. Well, of course, that's where America came from, is from Europe. So we are continually uh, operating under a Vatican European system and don't even realize it. So uh, as you begin to see how this system works and that money is actually water, and of course your body, as I said, is almost 90% water, 
And your body is a biological battery. It's a battery, an electrical battery. And so if you get into hot water, they're going to put you in a cell because of what you do with the electrical uh, battery. It's called a cell. So they're going to put you in a cell. So the entire superstructure of our laws, of our government, is based on a cult hidden symbolism that the Vatican has been using for over 2,300 years. Rome has used these terms and symbols to manipulate, exploit, and control people around the world. Which brings me to my pet subject, and, and I may seem to be rattling on because there's so many things I'd like to be able to sit down and really explain to you, but there's so many different subjects that I've been looking at for so many years. But what I really would like for you to understand is that religion is the basis for all government on the earth. The church itself, the very word church, people talk about going to church and have no idea in the world what the word church means. Go back and look at the word church and you will find the word church comes from a, <clears throat> from a Scottish word. The English word is C-H-U-R-C-H, church. But in the Oxford Dictionary of the English language, you will find that church in the English language is traced back to a word in Scotland, Kirk. Kirk is, is a church in Scottish. That's why you have Captain Kirk on the ship Enterprise, because that's what churches are. They are enterprise, they're corporations. That's why they're divided into denominations, like 20s and 100s and 50s. Denominations, money. It's just a, it's just a corporation. It has nothing to do with anything spiritual. It has nothing to do with any divine presence in the universe. It's a business. The whole world is a business. And churches get their name from, that word comes from Kirk. But interesting, the word Kirk comes from a Greek goddess named Circe or Circe. And the Greek goddess Circe was referred to as Mother Circe or Mother Circe or Mother Kirk, or Mother Church. And Circe in Greek mythology, if you go back and look at it, Circe was the goddess who was able to hypnotize people, bring them into her home, lock the door behind them, take their minds from them so that they would have no individuality ever again, take their minds from them, and now feed off of them, eat them, turn them into animals and eat them, or feed off of them. Well, this is exactly what Mother Church has done. In both England and America and around the Western world, the church has brought people in, magically brought them into her home, into her house, shut the door behind them so they no longer have any brains, they don't think, they don't question, they don't know, they don't ask, they don't have it. All they know is they're told what to do and they follow directions. And then, then of course, they give them money. They send their checks. So therefore, Mother Kirk is still, and Mother Circe is still living off of the people. And it's until such time as the people wake up and find out that the entire system of government, religion, theology, law, education, the entire superstructure of Western civilization is based on an occult order of Rome going back some 23 to 2400 years ago. And the people are continually being sucked into this enormous machine and never realizing for a moment they have lost their freedom, they've lost their integrity, they've lost their sovereignty. We've lost it all. I mean, Bob, Bob Dean was talking about the tragedies that are going on today. And when you see the, the uh, as a matter of fact, I have a quote. Let me give you a couple of classic examples of what's and the, uh, the BBC of England had a quote from the BBC News yesterday. This is from a guy named Robert Preston, BBC business editor, said, quote, The credit crunch is creating a new world order in banking and finance. Yeah, so what's going on in Washington, D.C. is purely business. Most people are, are crying and complaining about the bailout. They have no idea in the world. The United States is a corporation. It's a corporation. There's a world of difference between the United States of America as opposed to the United States. The United States, as far back as 1871, was considered a corporation, a privately owned corporation. And all corporations of anybody who has 
a corporation knows that corporations have to have a president, and they have to have a vice president and a secretary treasurer. That's corporate law. So today you have Bush, who's the a, who's a president of, not America, once a year they have a corporate board meeting called the, the, the Union, State of the Union, which is simply a corporate board meeting for the shareholders of the corporation, which is you. And so they say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. They never say president of America. He's not the president of the country called America. He's the president of a privately owned company chartered out of England. It is a, it is a religious Roman called the Religious Roman Trust. And it's referred to as the United States Corporation. So anytime you are looking at the United States government, what you're looking at is a privately owned company. It's a privately owned company. And most, most Americans have no idea in the world about that. They thought that the Congress represents America. The Congress does not represent America. Ask anybody in government, where is the United States? Ask anybody in government who is educated and knowledgeable. And I ask people this all the time. Can you find the United States on a map? And they point to the United States of America, the, the country is, no, no. I said the United States, where is it? The one that George Bush is the president of. And they point to the country called America. No, go back and ask in a corporate attorney or sit down with somebody who studied this subject and you will find that the word United States is applied to a 10 mile square called Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a 10 mile square and by law, that is referred to as United States. Now, the rest of the country is all a confederation of sovereign states. They're all different countries. But the United States is a privately owned company, a privately owned corporation, which, and each, each one of us is a U.S. citizen, so you are part of this corporation. And for California in particular, this will be interesting. If you say that you are a United States citizen, then what you're saying in law is that you are an employee of a privately owned company called the United States, which is chartered out of England. <clears throat> and therefore, if you're in California, working in California, you're making money here, then you are referred to as a franchisee of a foreign corporation. Because if you're employed by a corporation in, in Washington, D.C., and you're working here and making money, then this is, you are like a franchisee. Like if you open up your own McDonald's here, you don't own McDonald's, you own your McDonald's, but you don't own McDonald's. So therefore you're a franchisee of a foreign corporation because the corporation is in a different place. And so today, in the 1849 Constitution of the, of the California State Constitution, the original Constitution, 1849, said that there would be no state taxes ever charged in California state. California has no state taxes, period. But we do have a California Franchise Tax Board because you are a franchisee of a foreign privately owned corporation called United States, of which George Bush is the president of a privately owned company. And you are the security on the stock exchange for the corporation. I am not the world's foremost authority on any of this. I'm just giving you concepts to think about. Conceptual ideas to, so that you can wake up to realize that your sovereignty is in the hands of the God who created you. You are an individual and you are alive because of the spirit, the great spirit that gives all life to the universe has given us our life. And therefore, you need to start thinking in terms of your own individual sovereign thinking and not go along to get along and go with the flow what everybody else is into. Because ultimately, you're going to find out you've been had, you've been lied to. And everything that you've been taught is not true. The science, science alone, is totally incorrect. Totally incorrect. The science has become a religion. Scientists get their money from government, so consequently they just do whatever they're told, and whatever the scientists, the scientific community believes to be true, that's what all scientists will parrot. Why? Because you're getting a, a, a you're getting a damn grant from the government. You're paying your rent from the government. 
So don't go against what the government says. And so uh, one thing in relation to this you need to also keep in mind is that the government, when it gives grants, government always gets what it pays for. Believe me. If they give you money to do something, you better do it. Bad enough that you don't, you know, if you take money from somebody and you don't do it, that's bad enough. If you take it from the federal government and you don't perform, that's serious. You can go to jail. So uh, whatever the government pays for, it gets. Well, when you look around today, as Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Look at the fruitage of the religious political system we have in America today. The fruitage. Drive-by shootings, gang wars, drugs, pornography, violence, corruption everywhere at every level and every institution. By their fruits you shall know them. So the idea is that you need to start thinking in terms of your own personal spirituality. And I would suggest, instead of, instead of being concerned with religion and the, and the political events that are going on, forget it. It's totally unimportant. My suggestion, and this is just my view, I think what you ought to do is try something if you've never done it before, and that is to talk to the spirit. Assume that there is a higher intelligence around you watching you. Assume that there is some kind of a higher life form watching you. And instead of being a religious person, become more spiritual. And the way to do that is so simple. Talk to the spirit by yourself. Find a place where there's no one around and talk audibly. You have to audibly talk to the spirit world. And ask the spirit world to guide you, to educate you, to make sure you meet who you're supposed to meet. Make sure you find what you're supposed to find and do what you're supposed to do. Talk as a personal relationship with the spirit world because they're here and they're watching us. And when you do that, strange things will begin to happen. We call it synchronicity. No, no. The spirit world is watching you. And after all, you did ask. I mean, I learned that from Bob Fernie. You did ask, didn't you? You asked the spirit to direct you. Well, now they're going to direct you. And you will begin to see that your life is changing. And the more you talk to the Spirit in private, the more things will start coming to you. People out of nowhere will start to call you, give you information. All of a sudden you've got a job going here, you've got people you're meeting there, and things are just happening. That's why the, the biblical concept is to go with the flow. You've asked God to direct you, go with the flow. See what's going to happen. Talk to the Spirit and say, show me what I am to know, show me what I am to do, make sure I meet the right people, tell me what I am to do, show me and I'll do it. And watch what happens. Very simple. You don't need a priest, you don't need a church. You have a personal relationship with the divine one that gave you life. And I'm telling you, it works. It's a very powerful concept of the human connecting to the spirit world. I've always been I've always been one who appreciates and understands that. I'm able to stand here and talk to you tonight. My work is known all over the world for what I'm doing, and I have been able to be in the company of incredibly important people and hear sensationally incredible things that I've learned from people all over the world. And I'm just one person. I just talk to the Spirit all the time and ask Him, show me what I can do, show me what, what I need to do, and I will do it. So well, I'm suggesting that that's what each one of you should do, and start thinking about your personal relationship with the Creator. Forget about government. Forget about the international arrangements and all this crap that's going on. It means nothing. Because I'm telling you, just as Bob Dean said today, and I'm totally in agreement with it, I think that something very serious is getting ready to happen on the earth. People like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas are many things, but stupid isn't one of them. And Spielberg keeps telling us, he was, uh, he was interviewed in Los Angeles once, quite a long time ago, and Steven Spielberg said, I don't make movies to entertain people. I make movies to comment on important issues. My movies are a comment on something of importance. I don't care about entertaining people. Well, if that's true, that was his own words, so much of what Steven Spielberg has produced, monumentally brilliant stuff, 
but we're talking about uh, poltergeists, spirit entities, UFOs, aliens. God knows all this movies about aliens and UFOs. As a matter of fact, Steven Spielberg produced a, I don't know, 15 or 19 hour television series called Taken. I don't know how, if you think about it, how much money would you think it would cost you to finance Steven Spielberg's movie of an hour and a half movie? Well, he produced a television series of 19 hours, mini series called Taken about how the aliens are here and they look like us and they're taking people. I thought to myself and I've said to producers in Hollywood, my God, what would that cost to finance Steven Spielberg for 19 hours? It was an incredible event. The point I'm making here is that there are a lot of people in Hollywood who are trying to tell you something. And I think very soon we are going to be coming face to face with the reality that nothing has ever happened on this earth by chance. We've been played for fools. Somebody higher in this universe is manipulating us, and I think very soon they're going to show themselves. I said this as much as 15 to 20 years ago. I believe that the people who are in power in this world are not human. It would not surprise me, and it's my personal belief, that the people in power in this world are not like us. They're not human. They look like us. Well, that's what the Bible says the sons of God were. They look like humans. I would not be a bit surprised to find out that this entire human race is being led by the Anunnaki, by entities who look like humans but are not truly human. And if that's true, and if that is in fact true, then we are in serious trouble. And the things that I have experienced in my own life tells me that there's something very serious going on on the earth today, and I'm telling you, I believe we're going to see something happen within the next six months, probably less than that, that the powers that be have in mind shutting this whole entire republic down. The one thing, that the one sentence that I have ever heard that was absolutely, totally true that George Bush has said, and it's 100% true, he said, our enemies hate us because of our freedoms. There's never been a more true statement than that. Many people thought it was silly and nonsensical to say something like, no, it was an extremely important sentence. Our enemies hate us because of our freedoms. And so our enemies are going to make sure they take away our freedoms. Yes, our enemies that hate this republic hate us because we, and this is very important for you to remember. This is the only republic that's ever been established on the face of the earth, the only country that's ever been formed ever in the history of the world that has a written constitution that guarantees the sovereignty of each individual in it. This is why in the old west days, of cowboys could ride into, uh, into town with a six gun, you know, with their, with their pistols on their hips. They could carry guns, and if they had a falling out, and there were two grown men, and they had a falling out, they could go out in the street in front of the sheriff's department, right, and right in front of the sheriff, and draw on each other. Why? It's because each individual man was considered a sovereign, and he is able, a sovereign can arm himself, and if, if, if the sovereign wishes, he can declare war on another sovereign. The King of England can declare war on the King of France any time he chooses to. It doesn't mean he's brilliant for doing that. It doesn't mean he'll win the war. It doesn't mean it makes sense. But he is the king. And being the king, he can declare war on another king if he just chooses to. And what are you going to do about it? And the other king has to defend himself from this, from this guy. So he has a, a right to arm himself. Well, that's the same thing that was the way America was founded. Every man has a right to defend himself, carry a gun, and defend himself. That's because we were sovereigns. But today, there is no longer any sovereignty. Today, the entire world is a business, is a corporation. So if, if I get anything over to you tonight, I really want you to appreciate that you are a sovereign and that you have a spirit that you're in control of. Do not give it to these people who want to take your time, your essence, your spirituality, and manipulate you. This is what I have been wanting to do all my life, because I have always appreciated wisdom and knowledge, 
and I wanted to help spread knowledge and wisdom. That's what I want to do. I want to help people to wake up and find out they don't have to crawl on their knees to our religious or governmental establishment anymore. Start thinking for yourself and start talking and controlling your own thoughts.